So, Psalm 138. Psalm 138. I am blessed to have wonderful sides of the family on both sides. Um, uh, Very generous on both sides. And I remember a conversation we had to have about two years ago. It's a, it's a, it's a good conversation. You know, it, it's a conversation we had to have that came from a good place. But it's a conversation we had to have about Christmas time. And it was, it, it was a, a side of the family that will go unnamed. But there, there are other grandkids on this side of the family. And it was Christmas. And we were opening presents. And... There were so many presents that my children, like, weren't even paying attention to what they were opening. I don't know if you've ever experienced a Christmas like that. Maybe it's like the first or second, you know, like Christmas when all the grandkids are together and grandma and grandpa just go nuts, like, like, like way too nuts. And you walk in and there's no floor space because there's like, there's presents everywhere and then you know, you've, you've killed a whole forest of trees with wrapping paper, right? Well, I, this was like one of those early on Christmases where we were kind of navigating how do we do all the grandkids, and, um, and I mean, there was an inordinate amount of presents. And it's one of those things, it's like, how can you say to people, look, don't be so nice, right? But, but actually, we realized something that was counterproductive taking place in our children, and that was that they were not given space to really be thankful. Or if they had it, this is a better way to say it, if they had it, they weren't taking time to fill that space. Because it was rip, right on the next one, rip, right on the next one, rip, right on the next one. And I wonder how often that love or that generosity gets accidentally taken for granted because there's such a quick temporal perspective on the next thing. And tonight we're going to study a psalm that's going, that's going to reorient our perspective of God's love towards us. And I wonder how often we get so fixated on maybe the good things or just the life in general that we have and we're so on to the next thing that that the space that we're given for thanksgiving is not adequately filled. Let's read Psalm 138 together. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. And they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. This psalm is a very, a very uh, simple theme, and it's essentially the idea that God's love and care for us should constantly cause thanksgiving. And so we will discuss how we ought to give thanks for the love of God tonight. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your word. We're thankful to be continuing in the Psalms where um, it's amazing to think. It's, it's just such a grace to think that we're nearing the end of this, this treasure of Scripture, the glory of this book, um, and to think about what it's done in the life of our congregation Um, Lord, I pray that in these final psalms, you would continue to establish your people in your word. Father, I ask for grace to teach. I ask that there would be an obedience to the scriptures. May the simplicity and the beauty of this psalm 
move us to greater thanksgiving. And we ask these things through Jesus. Amen. So as I said, the, the psalm is very simple in its meaning. I give you thanks, O Lord, with the whole heart. And then um, we're going to give thanks for his steadfast love. That's verse 2. And then we're going to praise him for his steadfast love in verse 8. So it's essentially, it's the steadfast love of the Lord that bookends the psalm. It begins it and it ends it. And so the emphasis of the text, what's to fuel our praise primarily, is the steadfast love of the Lord. But, but I want you to see some things about verses 1 through 3. So it breaks down, you know, our stanzas are uh, 1 through 3, and then 4 through 6, and then verses 7 and 8 stand alone um, for, for emphatic purposes. And so I want to show you some things in verses 1 through 3, and I want you to think about verses 1 through 3 as essentially, essentially a summary of life. A summary of life. That is, we are given uh, reason for our praise... We're given our priorities in life, and we are given the power from which we live our life. Now, I'll show you that. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. Now, there's some debate on what he's talking about here in verse 1. If he, is, he, is he talking about, um, is, he, if, is he poetically speaking about the rulers of men? He's calling them little g gods, because he's going to talk about the rulers of men in the next stanza. Or is he talking about actual false gods, false deities? Or is he talking about angels? In the presence of angels, I sing your praise. It's a little bit like the debate around Psalm 86. Like, what's going on there? You know, angels or rulers of men, or I think it's 86. Or, um, uh, or if, if, it's just, if it's just a different kind of false deity. Um, and I tend to think it is angels. That's just my opinion. I think that there actually is a distinction between those that he talks about verses 1 through 3 and those he talks about in verses 4 through 6. I do not think it's synonymous parallelism. In other words, he's not continuing an idea. Um, I think he's, he's giving a different idea. Anyway, it, that doesn't matter so much as the idea that he's offering praise. He is offering praise. Now, you could say the implications would change a little bit, and they might. They might nuance a little bit. But you'd still end up with the same priority, which is we exist to give the Lord praise. I bow down towards your holy temple. Uh, so the reason I think that this is angel terminology, some people are going to say that it might be priestly terminology. The reason I think it's angel terminology is because I think he's talking about the presence of the Lord in verse 2. I bow down before your holy temple and give thanks for your, to your name for your steadfast love and faithfulness. So we praise God and we praise him in his presence and we live according to his praise. And we do so with a whole heart. Um, there's, no, there's no partial lifestyle of praise for the believer. There is exclusive commitment to worship. The, the ideal for the believer is that God has all of who we are. And remember when we say heart, we're, we're thinking from um, ancient Hebrew concept, and the heart was the deepest center of the person. It was the deepest part of the person. It was all-encompassing of the person's feelings and thinking and priorities, which is, what Proverbs, which is what Solomon means in Proverbs. He says, as the man thinks in his heart. We tend to think of those as different ideas, affectional and intellectual, but the idea in the Old Testament is that they're the same. It's the same center. So we praise the Lord with a whole heart. This is our, this is our purpose in living is to offer the Lord glory. We were, Isaiah 43, created for His glory. That's why we're here. To offer Him praise in His presence on the basis of His steadfast love, knowing that His love motivates our praise. Now, obviously, there are other aspects of His person that motivate our praise. His holiness, for example, would be another one that He equates with Himself. But when we've talked about this a little bit lately, and, and I've talked about it a few times on purpose because it's because I want to establish it pastorally, but because it's come up a few times in the text that we've discussed. But it's like we said recently, um, again several times recently. Remember that remember that God's love is the ultimate expression of Himself to us, and that God has always been loving. God has always been loving before the foundations of the world. 
he was loving in triunity with the Spirit and the Son. And so, when he created us, he, remember, remember we said, I can't even remember what context it was, but remember when we said that God doesn't uh, love us because he created us. He created us because he loves us. Remember that? It's the idea that God has always been loving. It's just who he is. And so, in this, so, to, so to transport that idea to this text and to this understanding, it's not transporting it at all. It's just helping us underse- understand it because it's right here. To say that we praise God because of his love is just the most natural result of, of who he is, or who we are in relation to who he is. Because God has expressed himself in love to us, which is the expression of himself, we express ourselves in praise to him. He is due it. And if God did not pour out his love towards us, we would not only have every right, we would not only be given the same motivation and impetus to praise him, but we would truly only have to fear him. But he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and sound mind. So we praise him because he loves us. And we love him because he loves us. So we note the first kind of aspect about our life as we think about verses 1 through 3 is it's establishing kind of a summary of our existence is our purpose and praise, but you know we're also given priorities, and we are given priorities because God makes, or the Word makes plain here, the text makes plain what are His priorities. And this is a fascinating line. Sometimes if you, you know, I, I did this recently, um, may, maybe someone asks you, you know, what are your top priorities in parenting? Or if you, know, you could do it all again, what are your top priorities? Or, you know, if, if you could say this, these are the things, most important things in your life, what would they be? I did this recently, it was, it was a conference last week, um, there was a, uh, there was a man I, I hadn't seen for a while, and I, I had known him, he's kind of floated in the same circles as our family, and uh, Les Olala is his name, and um, just like a treasure of a human being, and uh, so I said, he said, um, I talked about my dad and our family situation and where we are in ministry, and, and uh, he said, oh, I would just love to fellowship, so we sat down, and he got me coffee, and I asked all the stereotypical questions you ask someone who's been doing ministry all their life, you know. If you were, you know, what would you tell your 25-year-old self, you know, all that good stuff. And I'm so thankful I did. But if you were to ask, like, what are your priorities, you might come up with a few things. If you were to ask God what his priorities are, what is, what are, you know, what's important to God? Actually, the text says it. It's a really fascinating t- uh, concept if you think about it that way. Um, verse 2, the, 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 the sec- the, the, it would be the fourth and the fifth strophe there. For you have exalted above all things. Whoa. Your name and your word. What a profound verse. This is every once in a while the scripture just like highlights something for you. And you're like, wow, how have I not seen this before? You've exalted above all things who you are and what you have said to us. What are God's absolute priorities in relation to you and me? Who he is and what he has said. His person and his word. Now, it's interesting, actually, this word name is generic. So, it's not, it, there's no Jehovah or Yahweh or Elohim here. This word generic, this word name is generic. So, it's, it's, it's speaking to generally the idea of just God's identity, who He is, who you are as a person. You have highly exalted, you have exalted yourself as a person and your word above all in relation to us. So what does God think you need more than anything? Him. Him. What information does He think you need to to exist and exist joyfully and with purpose and to live out who you are in Christ, his word. Now, 
This is not some sort of like egotism in God. That God has exalted himself so that, you know, he can be proud of who he is. He has exalted himself in relation to us because of, remember the context of verse 2, or the emphasis of verse 2, your love and faithfulness. Again, God's priority of himself in our life is for our benefit and for his worship. His name and his word. And I, I mean, I could go a thousand places pastorally here. And, and you know, maybe I should, but um, to just go one place, just to go one place. Why do we have a philosophy in our pastoral theology at Grace Bible Church of something called the primacy of the pulpit? In other words, the preaching is not only a part of what we do, but the thing that we do. Why do we think that way? That everything centers around the ministry of the Word. The singing brings us into the Word. The singing concludes the Word. The reading of the Scripture brings us into the preaching. The praying is, is, is intended to make the, the listener soft and the preacher hot and all of those things. Why do we do that? Because God has exalted above all things in relation to us His name and His Word. It is what we need more than anything. And so, and so if your, your kids get to the age where they start finding their own church or whatever, um, there are certain things you can differ with them when it comes to style and preference and what you'd advise them and how you'd advise them, but do not skimp on the pulpit. Don't do it. Don't risk. We, we must not risk our souls and the souls of our children with weak, cold, self-exalting, empty pulpits. They'll starve. And, and if, by God's grace, they realize they're starving and they think, maybe we should go somewhere else, praise God. Praise God. But God is exalted above all things, His name and His word. This is why we read the word. I don't know what that looks like for you. I don't know if you're doing the Bible through in a year thing. I don't know if you... You know, some people like to go wide, some people like to go deep, and um, I have found that I, I really do, I have to keep things fresh so that I am not um, spiritually proud. And so I, I've got I've to read the Word differently at times. I've got to be in different genres and I've, I've got to write different things and meditate different ways and it's like we've said before there's a difference between reading our Bible and studying our Bible and we're not going to get to studying our Bible if we don't read it we have to start somewhere but what's the priority of your word of the word in your life in your soul in relation between you and God and what's the priority of the word in your home is it a topic of conversation is there a commitment to the scriptures outside of what takes place Sunday morning. Perhaps we should just ask ourselves the question with the terminology of the verse, if our, absolute, if our priorities in relation to God are not his name and his word, what have we, ha- what have we exalted in its place? Does our exaltation align with God's exaltation? Or 
Are there rivals vying for our heart's exaltation? Family, money, relationships, fear of man, schedule, sports. What is our object? Maybe write this in your notes. What is your object of exaltation? Because if it's not God, it will fail you. It will disappoint you. And you have substituted a lesser pleasure for the steadfast love of God. And rather than finding all your joy and satisfaction in the steadfast love of God, there is a rival exaltation, object of exaltation. And we need to pray that God does to it what he does, like the the text that we talked about several Sunday mornings ago, what he did to Dagon in the temple. He cuts the head right off the idol. So that there is no substitute exaltation. So our summary of life, our purpose is praise. He establishes our priorities. We need to make sure our priorities align with his priorities, who he is, and his word in order to really make sure we're established in this priority of who he is and his word. We need to make sure he's, we understand who he has made us to be, who we are in Christ, will greater clarify and motivate our priorities, making sure we're living for him according to his word. And then we're given this source for how we live life. How can we do this? (laughs) How many of you had a day, uh, we had one in our home, um, where you're just like, how am I going to do this? Like, this next thing, this next conversation, this next whatever, I, I, I really don't know if I have it in me anymore. I don't have one more discipline in me. I don't have one more hard conversation. I don't have one more rock hitting the windshield. Like, we just, we're done. We don't have it. Um, Julie and I were in the Word this morning, and uh, we just looked at each other, and we're like, man, it's going to be a day with the kids. Like, immediately. It was like, they were up for like 10 minutes. And you know what? It was a day with the kids. It was a day. I'll just give you, it was funny. It's funny now. It wasn't funny then. So the rule in our house is when mommy and daddy are in the word, like the kids got to be quiet or they have to be in their rooms. And we don't want to be like Nazis about it, you know, because we don't want time with God to seem like something that we're going to you know, bring the wrath of God down on them for, but on the other hand, we want them to respect it. And we want it to be a priority in our home. Mommy and daddy need this. We have all those times we pray together, we talk together. So they're not supposed to come out of their rooms, or if they are, they're supposed to sit and look at books or play with magnet tiles or do something quiet. One of my children gets a toy megaphone, stands at his door, you know who it is now. (laughs) Hey, guys! I love you guys, just like goes off. So just to think through this, <laughs> not only is he not supposed to be talking, he chose something to make him louder. It's like, oh man, it's going to be a day with the kids. And it was. All right, but what if you, feel, what if you hear that you have cancer? Or what if you... Finally, after months of hearing that sound in the car, you finally take it in because you're dreading what the mechanic's going to say, and it's an ouch. Or what if you hear about a dear friend who has a physical circumstance that's going to change their life forever? Or what if you get the call that loved one so-and-so passed away? Whether it's a bad day with the kids or the most life-altering trials, how do we do this? Look at verse 3. 
on the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. You strengthened me. I poured out, I poured out my questions. I poured out my weakness. I, I poured out my struggle. And you answered. And you strengthened me on the inside. And so not only are we given purpose in praise, are we given our priorities, that which we live for, but we're given power in verse 3, the only source that we have to face those difficulties. Our access to God. Don't, it might be tempting to jump to the second line of verse 3 because it's so like endearing. God strengthens our souls. But don't forget the first, don't miss the first line. On the day that I called, you answered, you have access to God. Hebrews 4, approach His throne of grace boldly and you will find grace to help in your time of need. You will find help, but you have to ask Him. And it's better that we ask Him first. Not after we've put our plan together. And hope that He signs off on it. Like, like, like we're the architect and He's the boss. And He's got to make sure our plans work out. Let's just let Him plan the steps. If He can sovereignly or create, ordain, and operate time, space, matter, humanity, and is sufficient to overcome sin in Christ, call to Him and He will answer and He will strengthen you for what you face. Verses 1 through 3 serve as almost essentially a summary of our life. Now the orientation is going to switch from I, I, I to the Lord giving, or the Lord's giving thanks, almost like a congregation of royalty. So note with me in verses 4 through 6, the song of the Lords, the song of the lower case L, Lords. When I say Lords, obviously I'm talking about um, rulers there. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord. So we started with giving thanks. Uh, individually, verse 2, and now corporately the rulers of the earth are to give thanks. So again, we're, this is a thanksgiving psalm, namely for the steadfast love of the Lord. For they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. I want you to note a few things about, these, about, the, about the song. Um, I don't think I have it in your outline because I just want to work through it kind of conceptually. Uh, a few things about the song is, first of all, we note the audience is the Lord in, verses, in verse 4. The first part of verse 4 and verse 5. Um, they shall sing to the Lord. All the earth shall give thanks to you, O Lord. And so the audience of this song is the Lord. Uh, if you were to think about it as a song, maybe think about what are the lyrics of the song? What are the ly- lyrics of the song? Well, in verse 5, they are singing about, verse 5, they shall sing of the ways of the Lord and of the glory of the Lord. So what are, what are the lyrics of this song? The way of the Lord and His glory. Um, they're singing also, the latter part of verse 4, they've heard the words of your mouth and they sing of the ways of the Lord. And so the words of their mouth are, the words of His mouth are motivating their song. Again, we're back to the idea of the centrality of God's Word, the importance of the priority of God's Word. The Word of God is motivating their voices. Again, I could go down a really pastoral you know, route with that, maybe just maybe make connections to our Sunday morning singing. But um, the words of your mouth cause their singing. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord. Great is the glory of the Lord. So uh, the, the audience, the Lord, the lyrics, His ways, 
His word and His glory. And then the reason that they sing. For though the Lord is high, He regards the lowly. So the reason that they sing is verse 5, the latter line, the the great glory of the Lord. And verse 6, His redemptive heart. They sing of His great glory. And verse 6, His redemptive heart. For great is the heaviness, the magnitude, the weightiness of the Lord. Again, connected back to the idea of God's praise. I truly do hope that one of my accidental pastoral failures is not, because um, those are going to happen. There's, you know, there's, there's accidental pastoral failures, just things you fail to talk about enough or whatever. And I, I truly hope that no one ever accuses me of accidentally forgetting to talk about the glory of the Lord enough. I mean, what are we even doing here? We, we, don't, we don't breathe for any other reason but for the glory of the Lord. And our breathing brings Him glory. Do you connect God's glory to every practice and motivation of your life? Do you wash the car for God's glory? Do you talk to children for God's glory? Do you make dinner for God's glory? Do you have fellowship in your home for God's glory? Do you go to church for God's glory? Well, of course I do. Careful. Do you? Do you do ministry for God's glory? Many men in ministry have fallen under the auspices of working for God's glory. Many men in ministry haven't fallen, but they didn't make it because they accidentally fell into the trap of doing all God's work without God's strength. And that's not just men in ministry. That's every single day of our life if we're not careful. Doing the work of God without the power of God. Without Him in mind. Would you be content? Would you be content if you worked hours for the Lord per week and only he knew about it. Could you get to the end of your life content knowing most people didn't see where you served? Here's a way to know that you wouldn't be. How you perceive others' service. If you get really judgmental about everybody not serving like you or not seeming as busy as you, that might just be an indicator that you measure effectiveness on the basis of visibility. When God works wonders and glory in a thousand moments that nobody sees except Him and maybe the person that was impacted, You know, when I say, would you be content with that, the follow-up question it should be, or maybe the follow-up statement should be, that's where we should be the most content. That's where we should be the most content. Do you know why? Because if our passion was really God's glory, we would serve as a prism that just reflects it. I don't want to be seen. rather than a mirror, hoping we see ourselves in the service and other people see us in the reflection. Do we connect God's glory to every aspect of our life? Do your children know that your motive before them and before the church and before others and before your neighbors is to live humbly for His glory. And you would be happy if only He knew about it. 
and the people that you impacted at coffee or at lunch or in the basement of the church or in the nursery or wherever it was. It's so-and-so so great, so-and-so so great. Do you see so-and-so? They're so busy and, and, and all the while it's just maybe we tell ourselves it's about God. Let's be careful, loved ones. And you can be certain I'm speaking to myself as well. The audience is the Lord. The lyrics, his ways, and his word, the reason is his glory. Who he is, great is the glory of the Lord. I think sometimes, I remember, um, I, I remember when I was a child, I was very young. I remember it vividly, though. I mean, I think I was probably four maybe five, but I remember this vividly. We were at my, we were in West Virginia. We were at my, I guess one of my great uncles. It was my grandfather's brother, his oldest brother. No, the oldest living brother. And there was an eclipse outside. And um, I remember I was, because I loved astronomy and stuff like that. So I remember we watched the news together and uh, my grandparents were there and Uncle Donald was there and He's in heaven now, but uh, I remember the new, late in the news saying, if you want to see it, what you do is you take a plate and you take a needle and you poke a hole through a styrofoam plate and you, look, you can look at it through the plate. And so we went outside and that's what we did. And I remember being disappointed because it was like I can't really see anything. But why did we have to do that? Because it would be bad for our eyes if we didn't, <laughs> right? And I, I do wonder sometimes if that's how we look at God's glory we just poke a little hole and we look through a tiny little lens and we really just don't see it because our perspective is way too small. Rather than seeing God for who he is and his beauty and his purity. So let's, have, let's, let's pray that God gives us eyes to behold his glory like Moses and his glory in redemption, he has a redemptive heart. And we have seen this time and time again. I mean, what, a, what an incredible theme we've already seen through for Samuel. We've just coming off Christmas. I mean, we have really bathed in this glory lately that God is, that he cares for the little ones, that he's a big God who loves little things and uses them for big, big purposes. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. We saw this past week. We're going to see it again. And again and again throughout 1 Samuel. And having said much about it Sunday, let me just reiterate this idea and then we'll move on. This should motivate again our thanksgiving because it causes us to see that though he is a great God of, 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 a God of immense greatness, he has a capacity to love what in comparison to him is minuscule. Us. And so we should be astounded that he's regarded us at all. Summary of life, the song of the Lord's a song of thanksgiving for the steadfast love of God. And then finally, I want you to see in verses 7 and 8 the stability of his love the stability of his love. This is so interesting about verse 7. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. Um, I wonder how often in trial our prayer is that God would get us out of it rather than that he would be helping us. He would help us stand in the midst of it. Our desire is to step out of trouble rather than to stand in it. And, and David does not say, I praise you, O Lord, that you are my divine escape route from difficulty. That you're constantly getting me out of bad things. He praises the Lord that he preserves him in the midst of that trouble. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, for your right hand delivers me. Um, I, think, I think verse 7 is very specific. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. What was, and we'll see this, but you probably know this because you know, you, know, you know the Bible. Um, what was one of the defining difficulties of David's life? 
he had a lot of what? He had a lot of enemies. He was always fighting somebody, or somebody was always fighting him. And so, you know, if we think about the, the recurring nature of the trials that we kind of have in this life, financial, physical, family, relational, you know, employment, whatever, um, uh, enemies aren't typically one of them. Like, we're not going to war very much, right? But if we, the principle applies. The principle applies. David's recurring trial was enemies, and the Lord preserves him there. And whatever your recurring trial is, the Lord preserves you there. He will help you stand in the midst of it. Your right hand delivers, saves, is that word. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. And do not forsake the work of your hands. Well, what work is that? I tend to think the specific, the specific thing that we're supposed to see, it, specifically in reference to verse 6, and then following the deliverance of the Lord, the latter part of verse 7, I think the work is, is most clearly his redemptive work, his saving work. Don't stop delivering us. Don't stop preserving us. And what keeps us standing? The steadfast love that endures forever. And how can we stand in the midst of Trouble, how are we preserved in the midst of trouble? The steadfast love that endures forever. What do we live for? God's glory as a byproduct of his love for us. What are our priorities in life? Who he is, love, and how we grow more closely to his person in love and because of his love. And how do we do that? We prioritize His Word where we communicate with Him and learn more of His love. Um, I have a Bible on my shelf. It was one of my first ones. And I did this because someone told me I should and I thought it was a good idea. It just occurred to me the other day. Uh, right above Genesis 1, I have, I have written, Dear Kyle. And then right at the end of Revelation 22, I have written, love God. Because someone challenged me to think of your Bible as God's love letter to you, where he expresses himself. And how in the world can we face this life? God and his love gives us resource to live his power And how do we stand in the midst of trial? The stability of his steadfast love. Loved one, listen to me. The security or insecurity of your life is directly proportionate to your understanding of his love for you. If I really want to stand in the midst of trial, all I need to do is know his love more deeply and grow in that love. I mean, I just love, all I can think of Psalm 90, as I was studying this text, is Psalm 90. His love dawns every day. I will never sleep unloved by God and I will never wake unloved by God. So satis Psalm 90, so satisfy us in the morning with your love. So that we don't end up like a child who's so distracted by everything else that they're not rightly giving thanks. And they don't recognize the gift of love behind that. Because we're so distracted by busyness and life and and all the goodness of God, we're just right on the next thing, right on the next thing, right on the next thing, and we're not giving space for thanksgiving because of the immense motivation of God's love. 
Psalm 138 teaches us that God's love is the source and the center of our lives. God's love is the source. It's how I live. It's the only thing that's going to get me through. It's the only strength that I have and the center. It's what aligns me. It's what motivates me. It's what keeps me stable and secure. God's love is the source and center of our lives. Would you pray with me?